Hi everyone, I'm Bob Polinsky, Master of Wine. If you're a subscriber to this channel, thank you very much. If you're a newbie or maybe you've watched some of the videos but you've not yet subscribed, I'm hoping this video will encourage you to do so as it very much helps this channel. Today's video is a focus on the iconic red wines from Veneto. I'm going to discuss Valpolicella, Valpolicella Rapasso, Amarone, and Amarone Recioto. In addition, I'm also going to discuss the grape varieties that are key to making these wines, a bit about the wines themselves. The uh, video is going to conclude with a tasting of two wines, and at the very end, there's a little added bonus as well. Recently, a group of growers from Valpolicella were making a tour of the U.S. They stopped in San Francisco. There I attended a seminar and trade tasting event. The seminar was very well run, quite educational. The tasting itself was a range of wines from various styles from small producers, followed by a trade tasting that was well attended. It was a good chance to interact with various growers, ask lots of questions, and to taste a lot of wine. Veneto is located up in the northeast part of Italy. Agriculture, and especially wine production, plays a very significant role in the economy there. It's a very large area. Uh, there are many valleys that run north and south, 11 valleys, that is. And there's a tremendous amount of soil uh, variation and temperature variation throughout the region. On the far west, uh, it butts up against Lake Garda, which is a massive lake. The lake itself is about the same size as all of Napa Valley. As you move to the east, you're up against the Adriatic. Also, many of the best vineyard sites will be planted on slopes. Those slopes will have a southern exposure, which is very typical in marginal regions in the northern hemisphere. What that does is it allows for very good drainage, it also allows for less fertility in the vineyards, which naturally keeps the yields down. And also that southern exposure helps to extend the growing season. There's also a very wide diurnal swing of temp. And what I mean by that is the daytime temp versus the nighttime temp can have a massive swing. And what happens with this is the warmer days allow for, uh, for the vine to actually mature the fruit. At night, that cool temp helps to retain the acidity, which lends to uh, a freshness and vibrancy to the finished wines. Within the region, the vast majority of the wine estates are relatively small, typically about 10 to 50 hectares in size. Most of the properties are family owned. There are some corporate owned uh, entities there, but for the most part, these are proprietary family owned estates. The region as a whole is planted to about 97% indigenous grape varieties, 3% being those international grape varieties. This is actually quite different than some other regions within Italy that have very much embraced more of the international. And what I mean by that are things like Cabernet Sauvignon, Merlot, and so on. Within the, the wines that we're going to be discussing, this is all indigenous grape varieties. Uh, the primary driver there is Corvina. Corvina provides a lot of the backbone, a lot of the structure, the weight, that the heft and substance that the wine has. The next is uh, Rondinella, and Rondinella provides more of the, the savory component that you'll find in many of these wines. The other is Molinara, and Molinara has kind of a, a strange sort of look to it, almost like a, a dusty sort of bloom on, on the exterior of the grape variety it helps to provide a good amount of acidity. And the fourth grape variety that is a major player there is one I always struggle pronouncing, especially when I haven't had much wine to drink. It's called Corvenone. And this is a grape variety that is growing in prominence in recent years for a couple of reasons. For one, it's a heat resistant grape variety. In many places around the world, there's a growing concern about global warming. This grape variety is suited to warmer climate, performs very well, and the character that you get from this grape is, is really very positive. Uh, it has a, uh, a black cherry characteristic and a savory spice note as well. So it's increasingly become a more prominent player in Veneto. The list of other grape varieties used in the region go on and on, but the four that I've mentioned are the primary players and the major components within all the blends that we'll be tasting today. So what can be expected from these wines? Well, we have four that we're discussing. The first three think of in this ascending order, Valpolicella, 
Valpolicella Rapasso, and Amarone. As you move up, the wines have more depth, more weight, more concentration, and more aging potential. The last one, the Amarone Recioto, is a different style. It has some sweetness. The alcohol level is actually a bit lower. It has excellent longevity, but it's really a, a very unique style. It's not all that common, but I've had amazing examples of it, and it's definitely worth searching out. There's a couple of other terms that are rather common that are good to know. Uh, superiore will show up on some labels. And what this means is the fruit has been allowed to uh, get a bit riper, which means a little more alcohol in the finished wine, a bit more body. The wine also has a bit more aging before it's released. And the other term that is fairly common is the word classico. And as the name implies, think of this as really being attached to those hillsides and generally the more premium areas within the region. In terms of production methods for these wines, there's not a whole lot to tell with basic Valpolicella. It's a straightforward vinification process, very much like most other red wines uh, around the world. What is different is when you get to the Rapasso method. And with Rapasso, essentially what's happening with this is the pumice or those grape skins that were used with the production of Amarone or Recioto are being used a second time. And this results in a second fermentation with the wine, but you increase the level of grape skin to grape juice. Most of the character of the wine, the aromatics, the color, the flavor, much of that is coming from the skin. So it concentrates the wine. Now, back in 2019, there was a law change in Italy. And not only is the pumice or the grape skins being utilized, but also some of the actual fermented wine for Amarone or Recioto as well. It must be at least 10%. That bodes very well for the production of Rapasa going forward. It actually gives the wines more depth, more character. It protects the integrity of the wines. And in my opinion, Valpolicella Rapasso is some of the greatest values in the world. I'm going to post several down in the description below. These are worth searching out. Moving on to the production of Amarone, this is one of the world's most unique wines. Personally, it's one of my all-time favorites as well. It's made from partially dried fruit. Historically, this fruit was hung on ropes or strings vertically. A good amount of air movement around those clusters would gradually uh, dehydrate the fruit. Now it's laid out on slotted bins with air movement all about. Generally, it's 90 to 120 days of air drying. Here's a look at Corvina after nearly four months of being air dried. About 30 to 50% of the water volume is lost. Within the range of Amarone, there's a few different styles that can play out as well. Traditionally, the wines have been aged in large neutral oak. That's still sometimes used. Occasionally, there's now uh, more introduction of smaller French oak barrels Newer oak is oftentimes used. Also within the drying process for the fruit itself, occasionally there's an introduction of botrytis or that noble rot character. Now for most red wine production, this would be the absolute kiss of death. For some of the very old traditional style of Amarone, you will find a bit of that botrytis character. In effect, what happens with this is uh, it affects the color it also can elevate the volatile acidity level in the wine, which sounds like a bad thing, but this wine has so much depth, weight, structure, it actually is, in some cases, an absolute fantastic delight to have into the wine. Also for the Recioto style, the sweeter style, essentially what's happening there is the fermentation is stopping before the fermentation is complete, therefore the finished wine will have some residual sugar, and the alcohol content will be a tad lower because that sugar has not all been converted. I'm going to be tasting two wines, a Valpolicella Rapasso and also an Amarone. The first one, the Rapasso, is one I picked up at Trader Joe's. It's a 2020 vintage Valpolicella Rapasso Superior Cecilia Beretta. This was $11.99 at Trader Joe's. That's California pricing. Now, generally speaking, Rapasso wine from uh, estate bottled producers is usually going to be in that $20, $25 range, sometimes even a little bit higher than that. This one is very inexpensive, so I'm curious to see what this shows. 
Uh, the color on this is rather pale, which is what's expected for this type of wine. Just moderately intense on the aromatics. It does have a bit of that Morello cherry character. It's a little bit of a savory spice note, maybe even a, a bit of a, a coffee uh, whiff to this wine, but not very broad, not very expansive, but clean, very direct style aromatics. Good weight on the palate. Good up front, mid, back palate, not overly complex, but very well made, super soft, very refined style. Uh, this is a very good introduction to Valpolicella Rapasso. Top estates are going to show much more character than this wine. But if you haven't tried this style of wine and you want to give it a shot, you've got access to a TJ's, this is worth picking up as, as an entry point into this style of wine. Well, off to the second wine. This is a 2017 Luigi Rigetti Amarone. I uh, picked this up at total for $40. Rigetti gets quite good distribution throughout the U.S. It also is sold in a number of export markets as well. Uh, I visited this property some years ago, back around 2005. I spent a good part of the day with, with Luigi. Uh, older gentlemen, we drank coffee and grappa all morning long and tasted wine all afternoon. That's, that's what I remember. A bit hazy, but that's my memory. In terms of the appearance, uh, this wine does have more depth of color versus the first wine. In terms of the aromatics, good purity. There's that Morello cherry character to it and some smoky oak. This wine does spend some time in new oak. Uh, the blend on this is 80% Corvina, 20% Rondinella. Corvina generally does play the role, uh, the lead role with most of these wines. Mm. Very nice weight on the palate. Full, round, weighty. Alcohol level on this is not uh, excessive. It's 14.5. Sometimes you'll find Amarones that can tick around that 16 mark. Some of the wines can support that. Sometimes they show a bit of heat. This has very nice balance to it. The tannins are nicely integrated into the wine. Uh, I think this is a wine that would drink very well for the next five or six years. Very good example of what this type of wine should be. It's definitely worth searching out. So I mentioned there's a bit of a bonus at the end of this video, and, and this is it. This was sent to me recently. It's called wine of the sea and sometimes you know you see these stories occasionally where some ship is lost at sea and some wine gets pulled out of the ocean after decades or whatever well there's actually someone who was doing this intentionally and this is the bottle that was sent to me obviously i haven't tried this yet but i've got to say what a crazy bizarre package this wine is submerged somewhere out in the sea i haven't actually read the whole story behind it but i've got to say pretty cool concept seems kind of gimmicky but what the hell i'm going to give it a try as always thank you so much for staying to the end of this video if you have any comments please post them down below i try to follow up on each and every one of those if you have some friends that might be interested in this channel a share would be greatly appreciated as well I hope you're drinking something fantastic tonight. I think I'm going to be doing okay with the Rigetti. Until next time, cheers.